for a potential future link to an alternate head end. Now, if the, our network grows to the point where you have enough density and you have two different paths back to two different head ends, suddenly we look a lot more reliable. In fact, we may end up in the future being more reliable than Verizon. Verizon, after all, is dependent on a single copper or a single fiber uh, connection through a conduit that's probably full of water. <laughs> it is has worked really well. As I said, we're a startup. We have a single pilot network running, but we have had some customers connected for uh, more than six months. We've had only one significant outage, and that was caused by our upstream fiber provider, Cogent, uh, who had a little fun. <laughs> network. Uh, address the security concerns by, you know, people might be worried about their connection going through other people's office space. Uh, we provide each of our customers with a committed uh, uh, end tunnel from their site to our urban head end, which in Boston is in, some, in a data center in Somerville, Massachusetts, where we connect to the internet backbone. And we're basically offering, uh, the, 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 the deal is, if you want to get our basic service, it's free. All you have to do is pay $300 one time to buy a node, a relay node, install it in your office, and turn management over to NetBlazer. Once you've done that, you can get our free service, which is better than Verizon Business DSL, it's also symmetric. Or you can get any of our premium services which we offer at one-tenth Verizon's list price, one-fifth the best market rate we're aware of, uh, and these are typically committed data rate services, uh, metro, you know, 10 megabit metro ethernet, 20 megabit uh, committed data rate services. We also have a shared service, not unlike uh, Cogent's business internet, uh, again, at a fraction of Cogent's price. How do we make money? Well, the cost of building our, of being an ISP is the cost of building the network. Our customers are building our network by and large. Uh, the cost of doing customer support, we're only providing web care. And the cost of acquiring customers, our freemium model and hyper-local neighborhood marketing uh, appears to be, and this is still a work in progress, appears to be a dramatically different approach to acquiring customers. So we believe we've knocked the pins out of the three costs of being an ISP, which enable us to be profitable even though we're selling uh, services for free or for one-tenth Verizon's list price. Uh, it is early days. On the other hand, we raised about $300,000 in seed money in December and January. We're using that to expand uh, with additional neighborhoods and verify that we can scale this. Uh, I think it will be another 18 to 24 months before all the technology that we envision is actually developed. Uh, probably two years before we saturate Boston, uh, three to five years before we blow it out to the whole country, but the vision here is certainly to be in the top 50 markets. Uh, radically different idea, a business-based approach to doing an end run around the telephone monopoly, the cable monopoly. Uh, the FCC and Congress. Happy to take questions when the question period arises. Thank you. Next to me, taking coax and putting the Aloha net on a coax. 
unfortunately called it Ethernet. Uh, and everybody thought it was a network like a phone company. But, and that's the issue I'm going to address here is the internet is do it yourself, but I'm forced to talk about the legacy. Just, you know, it's sort of like Henry Ford had to explain why his car is not a horse. <laughs> so we, we had technologies like radio packet networks, which were inherently, inherently unreliable. But so are the phone networks. The difference is you pay somebody big bucks to make promises of the phone networks, and what program? You just code around it. That doesn't go through, you resend it. And we basically, it was, it was just a coax. And there was a French network called Cyclades, which actually was a network of uh, uh, datagrams, real you know, reliability, and that was what inspired IP protocol. So yeah, it really comes from these do-it-yourself routes and deal with unreliability ourselves. And that's the key enabler. You know, any problem? And that's the thing about software. I, I grew up with the customer that software was taking over the world. And when you redefine software, you know, the world with software, you have this do-it-yourself attitude. Um, and we had a mix, we had lands, dial-up, so we really had to discover what worked. You know, it might work locally, we couldn't promise it remotely. So it's this whole experience of basically flipping the model from a telecom world where you're paying for guarantees to a do-it-yourself world and to discover all sorts of things possible. Yes, you might not be able to do high-speed video, but you can actually send messages across the world. So the key, so everybody writes IP slash, TCP slash IP. It, that's really confusing. There's IP and there's TCP and they're far apart, and that's the key. So, and we don't need providers, you can do it all yourself. So if you understand that, and skip the rest of the talk. <laughs> so one of the most useful classes I took was accounting. Not bookkeeping, accounting. The thing you learn in accounting is you have to ask you have to ask questions. Ask what problem are you trying to solve? Are you trying to maximize profit? Are you trying to maximize you know vacation time? You know, and you decide or minimize taxes. So you have to choose your measures for a purpose. Um, and the key is not to confuse those to absolute reality. They're just measures and models. So, you know, when somebody tells you what something costs, you know, how much is depreciation, what are the assumptions? The cost is not a fixed thing. If I give you a lump of copper, what does it cost? Well, is it refined? Is it wire? You know, how, how long are you going to pay for it? Are you putting the ground? You don't know these things. So, means, so cost is basically a measure based on assumptions. It's not an absolute. Same way, spectrum is color, it's just a construct. The only way, can you, how many think that we have a shortage of red? Well, then what's the spectrum shortage about? It's just colors, we don't run out of colors. Um, and how many, how many of you have been taught how do you set price? The way to set price, and any used car salesman knows this, you come up with a great story, the better the story, the higher the price. That's the only thing that matters. Sure, it has to cover what you think it costs, but beyond that, the better the story, the more money you make. Nothing else matters. And of course, supply, what does it mean to have supply? You know, if you want, you know, uh, fuel, well, if you run out of gas, you might do something else. There are effects, all things. The supply is not a fixed thing. It all depends, again, on what your purpose is. And the reason I'm starting with this, a lot of the policy discussions accept givens. They're called, it costs this much. This is the price we have to charge. No, those are the stories you still children. You've really got to push back as what are the assumptions you're making here? So if I tell you, you know, the horse's carriage, you know, it's not an automobile. We had to sort of learn to think differently about what these things were. So we're about in terms of, if you compare uh, the internet with the with telephony, we're about 1880. The cars are about 1903. We've still got reins on the engine to control it. And the steering wheel is not quite there yet. And here's an interesting one. When children, people talk about high-speed internet, what do they mean? How, much, how many seconds in a leap year? You're not a leap year, I mean a light year. You know, it's a simple question. Well, high-speed internet is really more capacity. It's like talking about high-speed electricity. 
So you, you, the geeky people know that. So we've got this, with all these terms like spectrum and, and speed, which just are there just to confuse people. I mean, it sounds like you know what you're talking about. Like it, you use the term communicate. What does that mean? We can use the same word and talk completely past each other. I can ask, what do you mean by broadband? But if you answer it, you're wrong. So I like eating the world is an oy your oyster. It means you, know, you can find value in what there is, but you have to be willing to be very tolerant and accept what you have. And the key thing is to understand, uh, you know, sort of with thermo people thought the mass plus like thermodynamics is a finite around. No, false. Demand creates supply, supply creates demand when you have an effective market. So when you find value in what you have, so one example I use, if you play with lady place the bet down, you're going to lose. But if you spin the wheel, it comes up a seven, you find all sorts of things you can do with a prime number. So you have to be willing to find value in what you have, and bits, as we get to, are the ultimate way to find that, you know, ultimate uh, sort of fungible, non-consumable. And you don't want to be all the rent seekers who benefit by forcing you to be dependent by limiting supply and great value. So the internet really is a market architecture. It's not the technology, technology enabler, but the value comes from the market-like characteristics um, that we're able to basically create. In other words, the more one bits you have, the more things you can do. Voice over IP worked because of the web. In the PSD, voice over IP, the voice over the network worked because of the network we paid a provider. Because the web increased capacity, we happen to get voice as a byproduct. Sort of like you're composting the bits and you get a lot of methane. And the nice th thing is, because it's so fungible, each of, and the key thing to what Preston is doing, Preston is doing, is local efforts contribute to the whole. And that's really the secret here, is you can petition all the government you, you want, but mainly to prevent damage. Uh, that the flip is, the reason we have a telecommunication industry is it's not viable in the natural world, so we don't have to create out of whole cloth. So to really understand telecommunications, you have to understand railroads. And if you read this book, Railroad, and some of us actually find that the books like that fascinating, about the economics of the railroads in the West. You got uh, you know, John Adams' grandson involved, and Stan, all these characters, because the business itself was a high capital business with no differentiation, and the main skill you had to get was shenanigans. And to talk to a term like that, because the European investors, I mean, the king of England fell for it too. And you notice the telegraph lines along the railroad tracks. And the key thing is that the interstate, the book tells about the creation of the Interstate Commerce Commission. Uh, as a way to sort of manage all the dysfunctional aspects of the railroad. You know, the industries that want to be regulated, because it's a real business that wouldn't exist, but they can make a deal with the government to keep them alive, the government. So we move ahead to telecommunications. And FCC, well, if you look at the website, they say they are modeled after the ICC. The purpose is to keep the non-viable market alive, because the assumption was that they had to keep making deal with AT&T because that's the best way to serve the public good. And maybe during the Depression when markets were not trusted, they believed it, as Lester Thoreau noted. But today we know that. So we have the railroads, I mean the uh, phone system, on rails or the network, just like the rail network, unlike the roads, which are not a network, data services, trains, and applications. Very neat model. The value comes from the bottom, um, and the money flows down. And you notice the money flows bigger than the value flow, so you make money. Very nice uh, business if, if you can get into it. And you make money by running all these wires. Every service had its own wire. Um, and then we, we got, that's Manila, by the way, still running those. And then every, uh, we managed to bundle the wires together so it looks neater, but it's no different than it was in the 1800s. And even when you put a fiber in, you create virtual wires by separating colors out and make each color a separate service. You know, it, it's like you look, open up the, your car and you find all these little horses running around. You know, and here, all these satellite dishes all go to the same satellite. 
Why do you need all this? This happens to be in Turkey. Uh, and what's different in cellular? We have all these cellular chemicals. Third, we're all having separate relations with these sponges. But we learned how to repurpose it. This is, anybody, anybody recognize this? I actually had somebody who recognizes this. My 1966 Anderson Jacobs and Acoustic Couple. We learned how to whistle through the phone network and repurpose it. And if you remember in the 1990s, the phone network was collapsing for some motor use. And that problem disappeared just because he stopped doing the stupid thing of using a voice pad, which is held down all the time. So we have, and this little thing in my house, is a, it could run 600 megabits to an app. And think of how many cell calls. And this cell phone, by default, will go over Wi-Fi instead of all the cellular network. So think of the, the, you know, this versus this. Now, the phone companies want to come in to, again, little stories why they have to build for you to use your own router, and that's mine. You believe that. So we have a government-defined business called telecommunication, completely defined by the government. So when I, I talk about community networking, they say, oh, we can't let the government do anything. It's like getting the government out of Medicaid. Come on. Um, and there's no synergy. Every one of these services is separate service. Uh, and they must be built in. Uh, and I, and uh, <laughs> this is a problem with running uh, Twitter in the <laughs> background. <laughs> Okay, so the key thing is bits have to be build or kill. And even if it's a pacemaker, those bits cannot get through because they're not worth it to them. There's no way they can make money on 10 bits if you like the on it. And they want transaction revenue. They want to put it, they're trying to get this now instead of saying, you've got to bill us whenever you pay us a little. I mean, it's Sicily I can understand, but not here. <laughs> So you have to remember, the cell phone is something the carriers gave you to put in your pocket. It's an extension of the carrier's world. They define this. How stupid. How many of you bought, buy a PC from a phone company? They try to sell you PCs. As a matter of fact, um, when David referred to it, Microsoft was prevent the carriers from charging per month for each PC. That was the plan. In 1995, the carriers are in charge of each PC and tell you what you can do. If you remember when they said no webcams and all these? That was their plan. Everybody's going along with it. I just, I can't even do it yourself for That just seemed nuts. So in 1995, I decided that you were going to run your own home networks. If you, anybody remembers back then, if I told you then you'd be running your own network, it would have been absurd. That'd be like in, in 1876 saying you were going to place your own phone calls. And of course, by 